Good afternoon to you. Mark Sutter, HurricaneTrack.com here with your first of the 2016 Hurricane Outlook and Discussion video blogs. Of course, it's the off-season edition still because, after all, it is only January the 4th. Hurricane season still many months away. Nevertheless, I use these outlooks in the off-season to look at the bigger puzzle pieces, as I like to call them, that might shape the upcoming hurricane season. And one of those, of course, would be sea surface temperatures. And this particular map is the sea surface temperature anomalies, or easier way to think of it is departures from normal. And I think what stands out pretty prominently is our El Nino in here, even though it is starting to cool down a little bit. Uh, it has reached its peak of about 3 degrees Celsius above the normal in the tro uh, tropical Pacific here. Now it's starting to back off. Look at the western Atlantic and the Gulf, just unbelievably warm compared to average. And in fact, I've seen people mentioning this on Twitter in the last few days. And I'm going to show you some actual sea surface temperatures of that region in just a few minutes. It's really astounding, all the warm water that still sits in this region. And it's really because of the pattern that we've been in. We have not had major Arctic outbreaks coming down and pushing colder air over this warm water, for one thing. And also just the lateral movement of the air, what we call cold air advection hasn't stirred up the water very much. We haven't had a very stormy pattern across the offshore waters of the East Coast nor the Gulf of Mexico. But I think that's going to change as we get through the next 60 to 90 days. And then the deep tropical Atlantic sitting eh, pretty much where it should be, a little bit warmer than average right off of Africa. And then off the chart up here, literally off the map, very cold water in the far northern Atlantic, which has led to what we call a decline in the AMO, or the Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation. That's a story for another day. Uh, we can talk about that more the closer we get to hurricane season. But let's talk about the El Nino real quick. Sitting in here, lots of, uh, lots of headlines and a lot has been made about the strong El Nino, the record strength of it. So let me show you what the different regions are. I've talked about this before. Um, the Nino region, or what we call the Enso regions, Enso, E-N-S-O, meaning El Nino Southern Oscillation. And we divide that up into several regions. The one and two region here, right off the coast of South America, a very small region. And then the Nino 3 area covers a fairly large chunk of real estate. And the Nino 4, slightly smaller than that. And then kind of overlapping like a Venn diagram, the Nino 3.4 region. And this typically gets the most attention in terms of where the warmth lies. And if we go back to the other map and we look at the anomalies, that would be roughly this region right through here. The Nino 3.4 area is where a lot of the attention is uh, placed. And then here's the Nino 1 and 2 area over here, uh, nice and warm compared to where it should be. But this is the region that we're most interested in, the Nino 3.4 area. And a lot of the computer model forecasts are run with that region in mind. So, all of that being said, let's take a look at what's going on with the pressure pattern across the tropics, what we call the Southern Oscillation Index. And typically when this is positive, especially strongly so, we get a La Nina type situation where the water temperatures in the Pacific are cooler than normal. And when it's negative, the opposite is true. And that's where we are. We've been negative uh, pretty deeply in October, rose a lot in November. Lost a few points back in December. It's kind of been going back and forth. And right now we're having a pretty big dip in the SOI, the Southern Oscillation Index, negative 30 for the daily value, and the 90-day average here is minus 11. Once this gets about to the minus 5 and higher, the closer to zero we get, then we're going to really start to turn the corner and bleed off more of this energy in the El Nino region. What the negative numbers mean right now is for the most part we're still having a pressure pattern especially in the uh, central and western Pacific that's promoting uh, a relaxation of the easterlies that normally blow through here, the trade winds. And so the, the numbers are going to pretty much stay the same for the next couple of weeks I think. In other words the El Nino is going to hold firm probably for a good deal of January. And then, once we get into February, we're going to see some pretty big changes. And here's why I think that's the case. 
this is a subsurface plot of this map back here. So we're looking at the surface here, and now this is sort of a slice through that surface water uh, of the tropical Pacific. And here's the El Nino at the surface and several hundred meters below. And then look what's going on all around it, a big intrusion of colder than normal water in the subsurface, uh, taking up more real estate uh, overall, uh, probably only by a little bit, than the very warm water here in the Pacific. So it's starting to lose ground. And this will continue to expand eastward, eroding this very warm water away, and then everything will start to shrink and collapse. And in fact, you can see in the Nino 4 area over here, extending into the far western Pacific, water temperatures have returned to normal. And so all of this will start to erode and break down. And then what we might see is a La Nina pattern take shape where this upwells in the eastern Pacific, the strong trade winds will resume from the east, spreading that colder water, mixing it, and then we might be in a La Nina situation, as the models suggest here, by the time we get to the fall. Look at this, the August, September, October composite here of all the different models um, for the Nino 3.4 region. See, right there, that's the 3.4 area. Check it out, La Nina getting close to 50% probability of being the dominant pattern by the time we get into the August, September, October time frame. And what time of year is that, folks? That is the peak of the hurricane season. So I think, as I said, probably over the next 60 to 90 days, maybe holding to pretty strong El Nino signal, then it's just going to fall off the edge. Uh, at least that's what the models are suggesting. But with all of that cold water in the subsurface lurking like that, I think it's just a matter of time. If I saw another one of these, a lot of people called that a warm blob last year. Lots of hyperbole was assigned these big words and scary words, Godzilla, El Nino, you know, warm blobs in the Pacific. You know, it's like, come on. It's just the ocean and the atmosphere working together to create these anomalous patterns. It's, you know, it happens every three to five, maybe seven years at the longest. It's not that unusual over the history of the Earth, that's for sure. And once in a while, you're going to get a record. I mean, that's what records are for, to be broken. And so this too shall pass, and we will probably be in a La Nina situation, as I showed here, by the time we get to the summer. In fact, most of the models, at least indicating neutral conditions, and the only reason that this declines is because the probability of La Nina goes up. And so that should mean, what does it all come down to? That should mean that we have a busier hurricane season in the Atlantic than we have seen the last three years. It should mean, but it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. That's what I'm, you know, it's the caveat. Just because it should doesn't mean that it will. But we can always watch this and see what happens on a weekly basis as we move through the winter. Now, I was talking about actual sea surface temperatures. Here's the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, these lines here, and what we're looking at, we call these isotherms, lines of equal temperature. And right along the shelf water, pretty chilly, as you'd imagine. And uh, there has been some cold air making its way down to the northern Gulf Coast over the last few weeks. But the deep Arctic intrusions have not made it down here near the Yucatan Channel, for example. And so look at this, the Florida Keys out into the uh, south central and southeast Gulf all the way over to the southeast Bay of Campeche, 26 degrees Celsius and higher, that's almost 80 degrees, it's roughly 79 and a half Fahrenheit. All of this water in here is still warm enough to support tropical cyclones. It's just crazy, it's January, this is not late November. Uh, and so this water is running well above the long-term average, I zoom in here, Check it out. If you're going to go down to the Keys, uh, enjoy it. Even right off of Miami, water temperature is still close to 80 degrees. And then out here in the open Gulf, you know, 27 degrees Celsius, that's 81. There's um, 28 degrees Celsius, that's 82 degrees. That's, the, I mean, that's phenomenal. It really is. And off the East Coast, not quite as warm, but still very warm compared to where it should be. Uh, these isotherms in here, 24 degrees Celsius. And uh, right off of the Outer Banks of North Carolina, only 40 to 60 miles offshore, water temperatures go from the low to mid-60s to almost 78 degrees. 
and that's pretty remarkable and then right here not too far off the coast of Jacksonville Florida there's your little 80 degree isotherm out there on this case it's Celsius so it's 26 C which is very warm that's the Gulf Stream of course and I think that all this warm water sitting out here compared to where it should be uh, and then the Arctic fronts that are going to come through uh, over the next 60 days we're going to see a few nor'easters this year that are going to be some real headline makers because you can't have those temperature contrasts without some kind of a major storm coming out of it. Uh, that's what storms are all about. The, you know, it's like Star Wars, the uh, battle between the dark side and the light side. And in this case, the cold air versus the warm, moist air of the western Atlantic. And you will have some pretty incredible battles uh, over the western Atlantic. And some of those are going to come right up the east coast. The Outer Banks could get lashed, the Mid-Atlantic with some very heavy snow, and then, of course, the Capes up here around New England. Uh, probably some pretty interesting times ahead over the next 60 days. So looking at lower 48 weather over the next week or so, this is the current map. Let me show you what's what here. This is eastern uh, portions of the United States. There's Florida, and here's the Baja, California, British Columbia, etc. Now you got your bearings. Check out what's happening. This blue line here is the zero degrees Celsius, or about 32 Fahrenheit. And so a good deal of the country below freezing. Only the deep south uh, and parts of the uh, southwest here are above freezing. So it's pretty chilly, as it should be for January. I mean, we got, let's face it, we got really lucky with the very warm conditions we had for the east in December. Some people didn't like it. It certainly wasn't good for the eastern ski resorts and the economy that's based around that. But for heating uh, purposes, you know, people's electricity bills and the fact that gas prices themselves are lower, there should be a pretty good boom uh, to the economy here in the east for all the money that was saved not having to spend it on energy. But that's changing because we have cold air starting to drain in. This is valid tomorrow morning, so Tuesday morning. Uh, roughly 7 o'clock Eastern Time. Check it out, a front coming into the Pacific Northwest, California. The Sierra, all the way into the Great Basin, the Wasatch and uh, Utah, and all the way down into the rim country here of Arizona, and spilling into New Mexico. Basically, anything uh, in the Rockies and west, you're going to have some serious snowpack, rainfall in California to, in some cases, excessive uh, levels, especially in areas that have had any kind of burn scars left over from uh, fires over the last two to three years. That stuff is cumulative and it sits there kind of waiting for the next big rain event and then you get these tremendous mudslides and um, boulders that can come off the hillsides. So you certainly need the water out here, no doubt about it, and you're going to get it. Some of the models indicating eh, some places getting five to six inches of rain in isolated spots. Broad brushing the west coast more, you know, two to three inches is likely over the an average of the whole west coast. That's a lot of rain and a lot of precip that they desperately need. 48 hours out, the storm system uh, coming into the Pacific Northwest, large area of low pressure over the western portions of the United States and just offshore in the eastern Pacific. Meanwhile, in the east, not brutally cold. I mean, there's the 32 degree line or zero Celsius. At least we're not seeing minus 10, minus 20, you know, minus 30 Celsius in there. Uh, that's really cold. Uh, so, you know, seasonably cold, maybe a little bit lower than it should be. And then look what's happening down here in the Bahamas. As I mentioned all this, this front came through, uh, Arctic air spilling in, and then you got all that warm water sitting in the western Atlantic and the southwest Atlantic. So as we move on out into time here, 72 hours, I'm not making this up, some sort of a hybrid uh, semi-concentrated area of low pressure tries to form just north of the Bahamas leftover energy from that front very warm water definitely in the 80s out here low 80s uh, will it get mentioned by the hurricane center is it going to be warm core and concentrated enough you know it really doesn't look too frontal in nature maybe a little bit of a curve to it there this is the precip shield so mm, probably not purely tropical or even subtropical, more just a hybrid sort of gale center. You know, if it was September, October, maybe November, this would more likely become more tropical. Uh, but we'll watch it. It could be interesting. Bermuda, 
Uh, see if I can find it on this map hidden amongst all these colors. I think I can find it on a. There it is, right there. Uh, this looks like it's going to be coming your way. And so if you have a trip to Bermuda planned, uh, probably going to be cloudy and rather rainy. This is four days out. And um, there's Bermuda right there, the low pressure area with pretty strong winds, very heavy rain. Again, if you have a trip planned to Bermuda or you have interest there, the next few days are going to be pretty squally, it looks like, as this low develops. Some of these wind barbs on here indicating anywhere from 30 to 40 knots of wind. So a rather rough time in and around Bermuda. Take note. And then out west, look at this, very cold, still kind of moist in the Four Corners region, the desert southwest, southern California. You need the rain, so I guess as long as it's uh, not too much and people be careful, take all you can get because after this year, the El Nino goes away and it's a return to drought and very little rain out west, most likely. Finally, by day five, this is the early morning map. 120 hours out, warm again in the east. <laughs> yeah, it's like the cold comes in and then the cold retreats. All this warm water here definitely has to feed back and kind of keep that Arctic air at bay. Eventually it'll win out. We'll have a sustained period of more than just a couple of days of that uh, cold air. There's Bermuda, by the way, the low pressure area finally getting out. And then pretty cold out west, large chunks of Arctic air trying to gather in the northern parts of Canada, close to the Arctic Circle where it's very cold and very dark. And this will eventually come south, longer models, uh, range models indicating a very cold period, kind of painted in yellow here, for the nation's midsection. And then we just have to see, does this break east and south uh, and tap some of the energy coming out of the subtropics from that El Nino and thus giving us an active storm track along the east coast? Well, that's what I'll be looking for. And if I see it, I'll certainly tell you all about it. So that's a look at the tropics, things we look for as we await the upcoming hurricane season. Um, some of the forecasts that will start coming out in the next few months, I think the first one will be uh, from Colorado State University in April, uh, about mid-April. Um, probably Joe Bastardi at Weather Bell will issue something in March. And we're going to hear more and more about the upcoming season as the El Nino begins to show signs of fading look for a lot of talk about a very busy season coming up. But remember, no matter what anybody says about how busy or not busy it is, nobody will be able to tell you when and where anything might hit. And that's where it really matters. Look at a season like 2010. Lots and lots of activity. I think it was like 19 named storms that year or something like that. And uh, not a single hurricane hit the United States in 2010. And there were a lot of them out there. So you never know. And then, of course, lower 48 weather. Remember... Out west, stormy, wet, lots of deep snow for the Sierra and areas inland towards the Rockies. Great news for them. Chilly, but then modifying for the east, so no long-term Arctic air anytime soon. And I'll take that. I like the warm air. Cold every once in a while is fine, but overall I'll take the warmth. All right, have a good rest of the week. Thanks for tuning in as always. I know this was a lengthy one, but we had a lot to talk about. It's the first of 2016. I do appreciate your time and attention. And I'll talk to you again next week. I'm Mark Suttoth for HurricaneTrack.com, and I'll be uh, back here next week.